Ioannis Cespedes is one of the most polarizing players of the 2010s, with countless stories and scandals about, and he was one of the most polarizing players on the baseball diamond as well, with a ton of raw power and defensive ability that could wow anyone. Of course, that was also brought with some really subpar defense as well, and there were even plays where he made really bad efforts in the field, only to turn it around with an amazing throw to nab the runner and get the out at the end of the day. Having not played professionally in MLB since 2020, which seems to be just yesterday but is now over four years ago, Cespedes' career in Major League Baseball is all but over. It's now time that we can look back and reflect on the career he's had only eight years of Major League Baseball, but without a doubt he's made a lasting impact on the sport, both here in the US, in his home country of Cuba, and around the world. In this video, we'll dive into the short but very memorable career of Ioannis Cespedes, see exactly how he got to be a national star in a Major League Baseball, and what he's doing now. Before we begin, it would obviously mean a lot if you could subscribe to the channel. Less than 4% of you are actually subscribed, and it would really mean a lot if some of the people who do enjoy my content but aren't subscribed end up hitting that button. It really helps me out a lot, and will get you more content not only from me, but from other awesome people out there making baseball content as well. Without further ado, let's dive into the polarizing career of Ioannis Cespedes. Cespedes was born in Campezuela, Cuba, to a mother who was a softball Olympian for Cuba in the 2000 Sydney Games, and a father who was a Cuban league catcher. After his father left at the age of one, Cespedes' mother really took over a big role in his life, becoming his first coach for baseball, and at the age of 10, after starting out with carving a wooden stick into a bat with glass, sent him off to a state school 50 miles away from their home, so he could go ahead and refine his baseball skills. He quickly established himself as a great player there and in the Cuban National Series upon graduating, placing second in Rookie of the Year voting that year to a player who stayed in Cuba his entire career. Despite this early success, he was left off Cuba's 2006 World Baseball Classic roster, and it was widely regarded that he was the best player Cuba left behind in their home nation as they went to go ahead and compete for a World Baseball Classic championship. That didn't deter Cespedes as he continued to work hard and have success in the Cuban National Series, earning a spot as Cuba's starting center fielder in the World Baseball Classic three years later in 2009. Unfortunately for the Cubans, they were eliminated in the quarterfinals, marking the first time since 1959 they had not made a finals of a global baseball tournament. That was a 50-year streak that ended up getting broken, although Cespedes did put up very good numbers in the World Baseball Classic. Upon his return back to his hometown team, the Alazanes de Granma, he put up good numbers to round out his eight total seasons in the Cuban National Series. Across those eight seasons, a 302, 382, 503 slash line with multiple all-star accolades. In Cuba, it's a little bit different at this level, where it's just the top nine players selected instead of an all-star team, but it was no doubt that Cespedes was at the top of his game. In his mind, he was ready to play in Cuba forever, and he was excited about the possibility of staying in his home country with his son and his family at the time. But in 2011, things started to change with Cespedes in his relationship with Cuban baseball. That year, a large baseball tournament was scheduled in Venezuela, and Cespedes was excited to compete for his country, and without a doubt, as one of the best players in Cuba, he expected to be on the top team. But he was demoted all the way down to the third team for that tournament, and it really made him question whether baseball was right for him. He was doing things incredibly at the Cuban National Series level, and it didn't make sense that he demoted all the way down to the third team for a national tournament. Up until this point, he had no desire to leave Cuba. He told Latin American agents who wanted to get players out of Cuba, called Buscones, that he did not want to leave many times before. But right now, he felt disrespected and, and that he deserved better, and maybe baseball wasn't for him. His mother, Estela, convinced him to give it a shot, go over to Venezuela, play, and if things really weren't working out, he'd get on a boat and come to America. And after returning home, that's exactly what happened. A plan was soon set in place for them to leave Cuba and head to the Dominican Republic where they can establish residency in Santiago with agent Edgar Mercedes and get Cespedes into Major League Baseball. If he's looking to come to the US, why stop in the Dominican Republic? Well, there's two options Cespedes could have went for, and landing in the Dominican Republic was a lot more financially beneficial. Should he have landed in the US, he would have been eligible for the Major League Baseball draft, and in 2012, you wouldn't get a lucrative signing bonus unless you were one of the top picks. The maximum bonus given out that year was $6 million, and at pick 30, which is maybe not exactly where he would have fell, but probably close given his age was a lot older than the college and high school players coming out, it's about $1.2 million, and it depreciates as you go down in the draft. At 26, he had all the tools, but it didn't look likely he'd be a top 10 pick, and probably would have fallen even farther down, so the money just wasn't there. If he landed in the Dominican Republic and established residency there, he'd be a Dominican citizen for MLB purposes and become a free agent where he'd be able to get a ton of money. 
because he was over 25, he wouldn't be subject to international free agency rules that they do for younger amateurs, but he'd be a true free agent in MLB terms. This is somewhat similar to what happened with Yoshinobu Yamamoto and Shota Imanaga this offseason, but without the posting fee that comes with a team signing a player away from Japan or Korea. The journey from Cuba to the US and the Dominican Republic in between was a wild one for Cespedes and his family, filled with arrests and car accidents, death and strandings in remote nations. If you're interested in learning more, there's a great article by Susan Slusser, one of the best writers in all of baseball, linked in the description about this exact scenario. He established residency in Santiago, Dominican Republic in January 2012, and immediately the showcase got sent to about 200 team executives, a 20 minute long promotional video that really hyped up Cespedes in ahead of free agency. Videos like this aren't necessarily uncommon, but this was definitely a special case of an interesting way to go ahead and get Cespedes into the league. The video begins with a Star Wars-like intro where words scroll by in broken English with a ton of grammatical errors as well for lots of clips of him working out. And I mean, like, a lot of clips. Like, too many clips of him working out to the point that there's very few baseball clips and those that exist are short and are more than three swings at a time if you're lucky. We also have, of course, the now infamous Cespedes family barbecue where he goes and has a pig on a skewer that he goes and flaunts in front of the entire crowd, as well as a nice tribute to his family at the very end. This was a 20 minute experience and I highly suggest you watch it after this video. It is a interesting set of ways to go ahead and encourage someone to sign your player. That February, Cespedes signed a four year, $36 million deal with the Oakland A's. To date, that's still the largest free agent signing the A's have ever made. Think about that. $36 million in free agency is nothing, especially compared to someone like Shohei Otani, who almost 20 times that value. He was the only one of his family to get a visa, so he left his eight family members back in Santiago to be the highest paid player in A's history for all intents and purposes. A disagreement with his agent on how much of a cut of that contract he was going to get made him threaten Cespedes' family with deportation from the Dominican Republic, and they eventually settled for 22% of the entire post-tax contract going to the agent which is a significant portion of the money. 2012, he had a phenomenal rookie season, a 292, 356, 505 slash line led to a 139 OPS plus, 23 home runs, 16 stolen bases, and four flat B war. He was once again second in rookie of the year voting despite a dominant season because who else but Mike Trout was available to go ahead and be rookie of the year. He also got 10th in AL MVP voting and just a testament to show that he really did come over and dominate Major League Baseball without any time in the minor league. After a crazy end to the season to win the AL West with a Josh Hamilton drop and a comeback at home in front of the passionate fans of the Coliseum, the A's fell 3-2 to the Tigers in the American League Division Series. Foolish Baseball has another great video on the 2012 team specifically that you can go ahead and look at the description if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the run that the A's went on that year. 2013 was okay, but his electric play really won over A's fans and his compassion and leadership made him a sensational player in the clubhouse. A 240, 294, 444 slash line led to a slightly above the average OPS plus, but he did put up some positive defensive value, a 2.4 ultimate zone rating, and was a last minute addition to the American League roster of the home run derby by Captain Robinson Cano. This proved to be a good addition as he cruised to win the 2013 home run derby, becoming the first winner ever to not be selected to that year's All-Star game. He had a couple minor injuries throughout the year, his wrist, his hamstring, his knee, but it wasn't anything that significantly impacted the A's performance that year, just more of Cespedes as a whole on offense as they once again took home the AL West, but also once again lost to the Tigers 3-2 in the American League Division Series. Heading into 2014, things were really exciting. There were a lot of really young, talented players who hadn't even hit arbitration on the A's roster and things were looking really exciting and maybe this could be the year that the World Series got brought back to the Bay. After watching the Giants do it in 2010 and 2012, Ace fans are ready for it to be their turn. He came into July red hot and was also third in All-Star voting, total votes behind Joey Bautista and Mike Trout, and after making the All-Star team, won the Home Run Derby again and become the second player to win back-to-back -back years before Ken Griffey Jr. and soon followed by Pete Alonso. The A's similarly were red hot heading into the trade deadline, 66 and 41, the best record in Major League Baseball, and had already acquired All-Star pitcher Jeff Samarja. Those around baseball knew the A's were looking to go ahead and acquire another starting pitcher and a lot of people thought there would be some really interesting names that the A's could get and a couple interesting prospects the A's were still willing to part ways with. Unfortunately for them and what became a huge shock around the industry was the UN Cespedes was part of a deal to acquire a starting pitcher. Cespedes got traded to the Boston Red Sox in exchange for Johnny Gomes and John Lester. This took shockwaves throughout the industry as the Red Sox had just won the World Series a year prior and 
the A's really thought that Cespedes was a big part of their team. He was a nice offensive contributor, someone who fans and the team really rallied behind, and although John Lester was having a phenomenal year, this just seemed like a crazy deal for both teams. Obviously, they were trading two talented players for each other, but it just didn't make a ton of sense at the time. Lester was a great player, although heading into free agency and Cespedes only had a year and a half left. The Red Sox wanted to retool, but the A's, it seemed like Cespedes was the guy who was going to lead them to another championship. This trade marked a turning point for the A's, and if you ask any A's fan, they will tell you that this was the reason why the season went awry. After being the best team in baseball, they went 22-33 and, and fell out of the league of the AL West and into the AL wildcard where they lost a heartbreaker to the Royals in 12 innings. Johnny Gomes never got things going for the A's as in 34 games of the platoon bat, he had a 66 OPS plus, and though Lester had a dominant year finishing 4th in Cy Young voting, he had a rare postseason struggle in the AL wildcard game against the Royals as he gave up 6 earned runs and in a 12 inning heartbreaker, the eventual AL champion Royals ended up beating the Oakland A's. This really broke a lot of A's fans hearts and even a couple days after the trade deadline, the A's still gave out a La Potencia which means the power in Spanish and was also Cespedes nickname t-shirt as a giveaway, but Cespedes was already off the team. They had already spent money on the shirts and they said, you know, might as well still give them away. After having a great time in Oakland with a 256, 303, 464 slash line, 17 hormones, and 2.5 F4, Cespedes started to really struggle in Boston. A 269, 296, 423 slash was a below league average OPS, and in 51 games only had 5 home runs and had a career low 3.3% walk rate, which is a significant portion down from his next lowest. After having some issues with the way things were run in Boston, he ended up getting traded that offseason to Detroit for Rick Porcello, and Porcello ended up winning a somewhat controversial Cy Young in 2016, while Cespedes was now on his third team in less than six months. 2015 was the last year of the four-year deal he signed with Oakland as a free agent, and heading to the trade deadline, he put together another really good year. A 293, 323, 506 slash line was a 125 OPS plus, and he also smacked 18 home runs as well. The Tigers, however, didn't have much success, sitting just below 500 at the end of July, and for the third time in 365 days, Cespedes would be traded to a new team, this time to the New York Mets for future Rookie of the Year Michael Fulmer and starting pitcher Luis Sessa. This was a great get for the New York Mets, a 287, 337, 604 slash line led to a 155 OPS plus and 17 home runs in just 57 games. He even finished 13th in NL MVP voting and also won a gold glove in the American League being the first player in the divisional era to win the award after a mid-season trade between leagues. That gold glove didn't help on the first pitch of the 2015 World Series, however, as Alcides Escobar hit an inside-of-the-park home run thanks to Cespedes' misplay off the ball as the Mets lost to the Royals four games to one in the Fall Classic. After the season, Cespedes became a free agent, and Sandy Alderson wanted him back in Queens, so he signed him to a three-year $75 million contract with an opt-out after the first year. He put together some very good numbers, a 280, 354, 530 slash line with a 136 OPS plus and hit 31 home runs en route to his first and only Silver Slugger and 8th in NL MVP voting. One of those home runs at the time was also tied for the longest in the history of City Field. A right quad injury kept him out of the All-Star game, but that didn't lead him away from criticism as he was seen golfing with MLB Network personality Kevin Millar while he was on the disabled list, which was not a great look. The Mets also ended up losing to the Giants in the NL wildcard, which effectively ended their seasons and any chance of winning the World Series after going ahead and making the Fall Classic last year. After that great season, it made sense that he would go ahead and opt out, and in 2017, he re-signed with the Mets on a four-year, $110 million contract. Unfortunately, that quad injury resurfaced and missed exactly half of the season, and in 81 games, he put together a decent 291, 352, 540 slash line, a 135 OPS plus, and 17 home runs across half that season. Things were looking good, although the injury bug did hit, heading into 2018, he looked healthy and Mets fans were excited. Unfortunately, he only lasted 38 games for a hip injury and subsequent surgeries on both heels ended his season, as he had a 126 OPS plus across those 38 games. After those heel surgeries, things really started to go downhill for Cespedes, not just on the field, but also off the field. In one of the most publicized instances of a player injury in history, in June, at his ranch in Port St. Lucie, Florida, Cespedes was chased by a boar, stepped into a pothole on his ranch, and effectively broke his ankle, ending any chance of him coming back for the 2013 season. Seemed like it might be a little bit of revenge of the pigs, if you ask me. 
2020 after he finally recovered from that broken ankle, things seemed to just become more memorable in not necessarily the right ways. It started off positively as in the first game of the year, he became the first player to hit a home run by a designated hitter in a game between two National League teams, but after only 8 games, he just didn't show up to the stadium. He didn't tell the Mets why and just wasn't there anymore. They had no clue where he was and a pseudo manhunt came out from the Mets organization as their highly played player just wasn't anywhere to be found and wouldn't contact them. After a little bit, his agent reported that he decided to opt out the rest of the 2020 season and before he did, he actually stole the lasers and smoke machine that former manager Carlos Beltran bought to go ahead and celebrate team wins. Maybe it was so he could get a little bit more action with the ladies when he was doing salsa, but I'm not here to judge his salsa seduction skills. After that display, teams were really cautious about Cespedes and after a workout in March of 2021, teams just weren't impressed and things just didn't look great for him. He moved back to Cuba to be with his son who was only 4 when he ended up leaving Cuba and he's now out of Major League Baseball, although he has played in some smaller leagues like the Winter Dominican League and others around Cuba. Right now he seems to be happy with his son and frankly, after you retire from your career, that's kind of all you can ask for. So for now, all we have are crazy plays, ones that I've actually been in the outfield for as I've seen him make wild throws, and also just crazy stories and memories and videos of him working out instead of playing baseball and being injured all the time. Although he was never the best player in Major League Baseball, I feel like it's hard pressed to not be able to tell the story of baseball in the 2010s without you and Cespedes. He was great offensively for a nice chunk of time, one of the most electric defenders, although he definitely had his shortcomings, and without him, a lot of crazy media stories and excitement of Oakland A's teams in the early 2010s just wouldn't be felt. Having only played 8 seasons in Major League Baseball, there's no chance he's going to make the Hall of Fame ballot. You have to play at least 10 to get there, but I would love to see what could have happened if we had a healthy Cespedes and someone who maybe wasn't just so interesting for teams to deal with go ahead and play a couple more seasons. What a dynamic player, an interesting, interesting story to follow, not only as a baseball fan, but just as someone who likes to go ahead and keep up on the crazy happenings of Major League Baseball. Cespedes could entertain you and disappoint you both on and off the baseball diamond, and that's not a skill that a lot of baseball players can have. It's somewhat impressive, although a little bit disappointing for certain fans. At the end of the day, Cespedes has been an incredible impact on a lot of people's baseball journeys, and... It's unfortunate to know that it will end very unceremoniously and in an almost comical way. At the end of the day, the Mets have him off his contract, he's been paid all his money, and although there was some breakdown of how the rest of that would be distributed, Cespedes is now out of Major League Baseball and into just our memories. He's living happily with his son now back in Cuba, and hopefully they can both live happy and healthy lives. Thank you again for watching this video, it really means a lot that you stuck around to the end. There'll be two videos here on your screen if you're interested in watching either, and please go ahead and hit that baseball or the link in the description to go ahead and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out a ton, and will also get you more content like this as well. Thank you again for staying till the end, and I hope to see you in the next video.